And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. Amen. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A man, a man that is the head honcho of Kefa Studios and a man of of probably 10,000 different paints. I haven't counted. As well as the as well as the man behind the currently kickstarting Banners of Honor, which we'll be delving into tonight. The one and only, the man better known as Kefa. Hello, hello. Hello there. Uh yeah, I'm sitting surrounded by uh, I would say about a thousand paints for sure. Did you count? No, <laughs> <laughs> no. There's just a lot. Mm -hmm. So, I'd like to open up at the humble beginnings, in a sense. Um, uh, walk me through your first introduction to role playing games and what made it stick. All right. Uh, yeah. So, from a very young age, I was. Uh, aware of tabletop games, but, but never had any access to like pen and paper, um, like Dungeons and Dragons or Vampire the Masquerade. I think I remember some of the older kids playing when I was real young. But uh, my first introduction to role playing games was like Super Nintendo role playing games, like Final Fantasy. Uh, and I was really obsessed with the concept of killing monsters and gaining experience points and going up in levels. And to the point where like, I would try to hand write my own strategy guides for these games from memory at school when I'm supposed to be doing homework. I was always working on something, you know, um, I guess role-playing game related. And then later on, I would use uh, pieces of a broken like hero quest board game that my mom had picked up at a yard sale. And I would use the game board and the pieces and I would make my own games. It, we never had the rules for it. Um, when I was a kid, I've, I've played Hero Quest, and I, it's a really excellent game. Uh, but it feels like it feels like D and D light, honestly. Um, but uh, I would use the game board and the miniatures and stuff to create homemade board games that I would play with my brothers and my my cousins and stuff. And uh, so from from about twelve, thirteen years old, I've been trying to create my own games and design my own rule systems and stuff like that. So I've always had I've always had a peripheral interest in uh, basically all aspects of the hobby: making games, creating characters, painting miniatures. Um, it's been something that I've been doing for a long, long time. Mm -hmm. Now, with, given that given that you mentioned um, game game making and some of the stuff that you did, first off. It could have been. It could have been worse. You could have. You could have gotten introduced through the actual D and D light, i.e., Dragon Strike. Yeah. Um. Which, for those who aren't aware, just look up Dragon Strike on YouTube, and you'll probably find the. Um, you'll probably find a rip of the VHS, and enjoy the pain. Yeah, we we did have a, a Dungeons and Dragons Sega Genesis game as a kid. And at the beginning, you can roll your dice to make a character as many times as you want. I'm like, this kind of feels like cheating, but you know, it didn't stop me from doing it 75 times until I had numbers that felt like they were way above <laughs> the average roll. If you ain't cheating, you ain't winning. Yeah. But now, with, with that, with that in mind, from. Now this is this is your first this is your first foray with um, Kickstarter. Yes. But from what I was able to ascertain when I did when I did my digging around, you've mostly made a name for yourself through the through the stuff you do with miniatures, especially miniature painting. That's right. So uh, I've been. How did that get? How did that get started? All right. So. Um... When I was uh, a teenager, I watched the movie Braveheart and was just obsessed with like the pitched battle scenes. You know, these armies of men lined up across from each other, charging across. 
Uh, there's one scene where the horsemen flank from the woods and, you know, counterattack. And I was just fascinated with the tactics of medieval battle. And then a kid at school had a like a cheap two-page pamphlet that you pick up off the counter at a game store. And it was for Warhammer Fantasy, uh, the precursor to Age of Sigmar, if you're familiar. And uh, I am inside, familiar with war- with um, wa- with Warhammer Fantasy and some of the really dumb stuff they did in the early days. Yeah, well, this uh, pamphlet on the inside had a tabletop full of like forest, and uh, there was a river and a bridge, and there was like wood elves fighting goblins, and it, it reminded me of like the Braveheart stuff that I I really enjoyed, the pitched battles, you know, with big armies. But there was also the fantasy twist. There was a, a wood elf dragon, and then there was you know goblin war machines and stuff. And I was just absolutely fascinated. Like immediately, I was like, "This I have to play." Everyone gets an army, you know. I was like assigning armies to my friends who, like me, had no money to buy these things. So, you know, I was like, "We're all gonna play. You're gonna be this one." <laughs> I was trying to convince everybody that this is what our life was now, and. Uh, it took a long, long time, and I did not get to play with most of the people that I had wanted to start playing games with. But uh, eventually, I ended up with uh, about six Warhammer Fantasy armies that I painted myself. Uh, my wife enjoyed the game as long as I did the painting. So I would paint you know, a squad for her and a squad for me, and we would both add them to our armies, and we would play games on Saturdays with you know some friends and stuff. Um, but yeah, the miniature painting all started with Warhammer Fantasy. And over the years, I started to get pretty good at it. Like at first it was paint to play. I just wanted I just wanted cool looking armies on the table. I didn't want plastic gray, you know, or metal men on the table. Um but at some point I realized that I was getting pretty good at it. And I started trying to compete in competitions and stuff. But the problem was locally, even though Surprisingly, because Gen Con is 30 minutes away, um, I didn't have a lot of internet access, you know, even into my 20s, I didn't have a lot of access to the internet. Um, And so I didn't really know any painters in real life who were better than me. So there was, I wasn't very good. I'm not saying I was the greatest. I'm saying as mediocre as my skills were, I was the best that my little town had to offer, right? Right. So there was there was no one that could push me or that I could learn from. Uh, so unfortunately, I didn't grow a lot for a long time. I did the same, you know, base coat, dry brush, like three color techniques for a long, long time until uh, I discovered some Facebook groups specifically for miniature painting. And very quickly, I had already had, you know, 10 years of brush control and like base coating and like foundational stuff that I was really good at. So once I was able to find people who could teach me these advanced techniques, I very quickly grew. I mean, every year I would become twice the artist that I was the year before, you know, for the first few years anyway. And of course it slows down once you reach a certain point, but, uh, and then I was able to start doing commission work to pay for my hobbies. So I would, Oh man, I think my first commission job, like serious commission job, was three core boxes of Shadows of Brimstone, uh, which is a, over a hundred miniatures, and I did it for like six hundred bucks. And I was like, couldn't believe someone sent me six hundred dollars to paint toys. You know, it was like I enjoy doing this anyway, and I can't believe I'm making so much money. But man, a hundred models is a lot. I quickly realized that. I had to change something if I was gonna if I was gonna be a commissioned miniature painter, I needed to ask for more than six dollars a model. And uh, so as I raised my prices and kept painting, I, I gained more experience from painting commissions. And the more experience I got, the the better I got at painting. And so I, whenever I got busy, I would just ask for more money. And people kept saying yes until I got to the point I'm. Right now, I charge uh, about $100 a model for, like, Dungeons & Dragons characters. So it took a long, long time to work myself up to that to that level and to, you know, where I could ask that price. But uh, it's definitely paid for a lot of hobby stuff, which is basically this entire room that I'm sitting in right now.
Uh, I also, you still there? I am. Okay. Uh, I also compete in like competitions. And at some point, probably from painting so many models for other people, I realized that I, I don't super enjoy that. You know, it, it becomes work like anything else. If you do it enough, you know, for money, it just becomes a job. But when I'm between commissions, what I really like to do is push my skills to the to the absolute maximum and create high level competition pieces um, for for convention competitions like at Gen Con and Adepticon, etc. And I do fairly well. I I have a couple of golds, but mostly I get a lot, a lot of second place trophies, and uh, it just keeps me hungry to come back the next year and try to bring something else, but. Now, with that in with that in mind, shifting from that to with Banners of Honor, given that you given that you've that this is your first full on module project, or even, or even just something book related instead of something um, miniature related, that I was it, unless there was something hidden I couldn't find. Um, this particular. It's quite a it's quite a jump, and I'm curious if this was based on it based on a setting that you had been doing at your own table, or if Banners of Honor had a different origin story. Okay, um, so through the miniature painting, I was hired at a internet board game magazine called Board Game Monthly, and at first it was like I'm going to be painting some miniatures and I'll do some board game reviews, but when it comes to passion projects like that, I tend to like jump in, you know, both feet with all, I become like a force of nature, even, even to the people working with me, you know? And so I began accumulating responsibilities with this board game magazine until eventually I was um, a managing editor and I was responsible for not only the board game reviews and stuff, but making sure that everyone else had their board game reviews you know, finished, edited, turned in on time, making sure that we had, you know, all the proper photographs, contacting companies for interviews and, you know, uh, like support in the form of board games for review and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I did pick up a lot of skills just because I was tenacious and I, I wanted to learn as much as possible. So I started out just painting minis and doing reviews, but I also learned how to do just a little bit of editing and, and stuff like that. I, I never went to school for it. Um, everything I learned was, you know, from other trained professionals that were willing to share their knowledge with me. So years later, there was another Kickstarter by my good friend, Angelo Peluso called Nightfell. Uh, it's an Italian book. I'm, and it was trend. I'm familiar with those guys. I've had them on the show in the past. <laughs> ah, wonderful. Okay. Okay. So, uh, they released a primer for their books uh, in English, you know, to show everybody what the setting was going to be about for their Kickstarter. And I downloaded it and I was already in communication with them because I was promoting their books on my Twitch channel. And I let them know that there, there was a lot of grammatical errors in the English translation. And it, it seemed like, you know, just like a rough translation. Like, and I, and I was very upfront with them and I told them, Hey, I'm not a trained, you know, editor. I, I did not go to school for this. I do not know all the ins and outs of the business. But as far as the translation goes, like localizing the language, I can help out. Like there's there's a lot that I can do to make this better. And I, I started showing them examples and they were happy with what I was doing with their their primer. So they agreed to bring me on for all three of their core books. So I actually localized the... Um, Italian to English translation for all three Nightfell books. Mm -hmm. And that led to my connections with basically all of the artists on uh, Banners of Honor, with a few exceptions. Uh, it also led to my connections with the, the guys that created the video and music for our Kickstarter promotional video, the animations and such, I mean. Um, and it's just been a valuable connection. There, I've had Mana Project Studios reached out to me for some localization also, mm -hmm. just word of mouth through Angelo. 
So that's basically how I got into the making books and, and writing side of things. Mm -hmm. While I was editing and writing and reading over these rules, I was like correcting a lot of things and communicating with the team. And I realized that I, I really did have a pretty strong understanding of not only the, the rule set of Dungeons and Dragons, um, but also just the the way those tools are used to create interesting stories and how to avoid, how to create good sandboxes for, for dungeon masters and players without railroad tracks, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, partnering with my friend Sammy Zamora, who um, he plays at my, my home. So my oldest daughter is 16 years old. And when she was born, Sammy came to the hospital and played magic cards with me in the lobby while my wife and daughter were sleeping just to keep me company. So we've been friends for a long, long time. And he's the only person I know who knows even more about Dungeons and Dragons than I do. He, at one point in time, was running all of the local game stores, like, um, what do they call it? The Adventure League games. He was running all of the events in store for the shop as well as running two home games in his own time and playing in my home game. So he's like an encyclopedia of Dungeons and Dragons knowledge and rules. Uh, he's also much more tech savvy than I am. Like he created our website. He's in charge of our newsletters, etc. So my strengths and his strengths matched up really well. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as Banners of Honor and the setting, I was super inspired by... Um, just reading through the Dungeon Master Guide, they have optional rules for sanity and honor, etc. And I ran sanity as an optional stat for Curse of Strahd for like two years, um, or maybe a little, little more than a year. We ran Curse of Strahd from start to finish with sanity as a seventh stat, and I really enjoyed it. Um, it I think it was a great mechanic. And... Um, I've had this vision in my mind. It, it started out, uh, I wanted to use honor. I found, you know, sanity worked out so well. How can I also use honor? And I was inspired by, go back to Warhammer Fantasy. They have the, the Knights of Bretonia, right? And uh, yeah. one, of the old, <laughs> one of the old Warhammer novels that I had read was uh, like Knights of the Realm defending their land from... Uh, a bunch of beastmen in the forest around them. And uh, that's why a lot of my map is covered with forests. Is I'm trying to, you know, I was trying to recreate that vibe. It transformed a lot over time from that. But that was the initial concept was, you know, the Knights of Bretonia, honor as a seventh stat with some sort of bad guy in the forest, right? Obviously, I can't use, you know, gores and ungores and stuff as much as I would love to. Um, so we had to, you know, just that was the seed that started the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's funny you bring up Bretonia because, well, we, because well, Breton Bretonia is more. Um, I'd argue that they're more French than. I'd argue that the way they act is more French than British. Uh, yeah. Especially, especially since Bretonians tend to be assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That I I think it would have been a an army I would have loved to paint and play, or I, let me take that back. I would have loved to play Bretonians and I, I love the, the heraldry and the colors and the concept, but painting all those horses would have been just a huge bummer for me. Yeah, I could certainly see that. And I'm not one to talk because my, my army of choice was dwarves <laughs> or dwarves, which is the reason yep. why I've had the book of grudges as a, as a running gag on this channel for the longest time. Nice. Whenever someone does something stupid or something to annoy me, or I, or I just happen to be in that kind of mood that day, boom, put them go, in the book. They go into they go into the book of grudges. Um. And as you as you're well aware, the book never runs out of pages. Uh, but. Of course, of course, I would be remiss if I didn't bring up a dwarf el a dwarven elven joke that is a fre is a frequent appearance on this show. Okay. If dwarves live underground, why do th why do they wield axes so much? 
The answer is quite simple. Elves live, elves in trees. live in trees. <laughs> oh. But given that given that um oh, I will I will note a bit of background. I found out about Banners of Honor shortly after I ended up delving into the Chronicle system. Okay. Which, which is basically Green Ronin's um Game of Thrones RPG just with just with the um Game of Thronesness filed off. Probably out of, probably out of shame over season 8. Yeah. <laughs> That's understandable. I love Green Ronin though. Uh Chris has been uh very helpful. He's given me some advice along the way, creating my own Kickstarter. And I told him straight up, like his books are among the best products I've seen, you know, from third party uh, game companies on the market. Like mm -hmm. that's the standard that we want to, we want to reach. Yeah. And obvious, obviously given, given some of the stuff I've covered in the past, something, Something, uh, something Arthurian in that in that regard was going to get, was going to get my interest. Now, Banners of Honor purports itself as a as both a module and a and a campaign setting. So I kind of mm -hmm. have to ask, which came first, the chicken or the egg? I think the the module came first, and we we so. I've said this before recently, but we didn't intend for the setting and the world to be this big. But what happened was we had to have a map so that we could start designing things around. Um, so I started sketching a map and we hired an artist. And what we ended up with is this beautiful map that has 18 locations on it. And I was like, oh, I think each one of these locations has to be fleshed out now. So what we end up with is 350 pages of adventure module uh, to explain this beautiful map that we have. <laughs> yeah. So we, we had intended to create a story of, of a smaller scale. And, uh, you know, we made some rookie mistakes, but we're prepared to live with them and deliver an even bigger and more epic adventure than than was uh, intentioned. And to be fair, ideas getting ideas getting away from you is mm -hmm. a time honored tradition. <laughs> um, I'm sure you're familiar with the origin story of stuff like Rollmaster and Chivalry and Sorcery. I I am not. I'm sorry. Um, Rollmaster started out as Arms Law, which was a which was meant to be a collection of house rules for AD and D. Mm -hmm. As time progressed, however, and they ended up expanding on the concepts within Arms Law, it kind of became its own thing. Until they just until they decided to just pull the trigger and just make it its own its own thing. Um, Chivalry and Sorcery had a similar origin story where it was a where they were where um the designers were not were not to where um. Had some issues with the medieval aspects of D and D, and they want and that was, and chivalry and sorcery was their hack that was meant to be a response to that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and again, that kind of you have a bunch of house rules that just took on a life of their own. Gotcha. Yeah. So, yeah, that's uh, very relatable, and there's already. I mean, as much as I am in love with this setting and this story that we're creating. Um, we've run into so many complications for trying to create a book this big. You know, we need a lot of art for a page, you know, for a book this size to keep our pages from looking uninteresting or being a slog to read through. It doesn't matter how good the writing is if it's putting you to sleep because it's just, you know, word column, word column, word column. So, uh, yeah, we need we need a lot of artwork for this thing. Uh, I'm a huge fan of fantasy maps, so we're going to put as many maps as we can squeeze into this thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think my next my next project, I will I will refine my skills into something smaller and tighter, for sure. Well, I remember a certain graphic designer once saying that the greatest innovations in the history of mankind were done by people who had no idea what they were doing. Well... 
I'm certainly in that category. <laughs> At least I, I was starting out for sure. I have learned everything on the job for this project. Um, the Nord Nord Games is our uh, kind of our guardian angel on this project, oh, yeah, and I know those uh, guys. it and they have been so kind and so helpful in teaching me marketing tools and skills. I mean, it was almost like an education, you know. Um, so I, I learned how to set up my own marketing campaigns and how to run things. I learned how to crunch all the numbers and and put together a really solid financial plan for for the project. Um, and, and it was a joy for me, like learning. I just absorb everything and I, I've always been this way. So no matter what happens with this project, um, it's been, I mean, it's already, it's already even almost a hundred or over 150% funded at this point. And I think it's going to be even higher. But what I mean to say is um, it's been a wonderful learning experience. And I feel like, if I got nothing else out of it, just just the the tools and skills that I've gained along the way will be invaluable moving forward, creating games. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of speaking within that, there are a few. Since I mentioned the house rules, there are a few um, concepts that are brought that are put forward in the Kickstarter that I wanted to pick your brain about. The of first of which is decisions of destiny. Okay. Um, how did th how did this come about, and how and without going into spoilers for obvious mm -hmm. reasons, how does it play out within the module? All right. So we wanted to create meaningful decisions for the players. Like uh, if they if they treated someone bad or or agreed to help someone, we wanted to have built in payoffs for those things to make it feel more rewarding in game. Um, as I mentioned before, a lot of my inspiration from role-playing games comes from video games, and they have, of course, supercomputers calculating NPCs' reactions to things, so games like Skyrim can almost never be replicated in tabletop form, you know, uh, unless you're a super tedious, masterful dungeon master, maybe well, you can keep track of all these It can't be replicated things. in tabletop form because there's no way to replicate all the bugs. <laughs> Fair enough. But there... There are a lot of things that it does really well that are hard, you know, to mimic in tabletop gaming. One of those things is how alive some of the NPCs in the towns and castles and stuff around you can feel. So what we created was kind of like a um, a tree of possible life choices that these NPCs will make. And each branch would be triggered by certain events or certain decisions made by the players interacting with these NPCs. And there, throughout the chapters, at the end of every chapter, there are optional story events. And these story events only take place under certain conditions. So each of these NPCs, and there's only a select few in this, you know, it's our first try at this. We're going to see what works and see what doesn't and refine it as we move forward. But each of the select NPCs um, can either take an honorable path through life or they can take a dishonorable path through life and leads to very different outcomes for these characters. So there are certain story events in certain locations that will only trigger if character A is on an honorable path. Then there'll be different story events. And maybe in a different location, that same character will have optional story events only if they're on a dishonorable path. So we're... We're trying to create callbacks to these characters through through side quests and and optional missions uh, at each location. Mm -hmm. Now, with with that in mind, given that given the whole side things, um, have you been taking steps to make sure that the side that the side part doesn't um o doesn't overstep, or to put it another way, you don't run into the Witcher 3 problem. <laughs> oh, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, so the it actually started out uh, just like what I'm telling you now, and what it evolved into is every single chapter has story events at the end of the chapter, not only for the NPCs in question, but also for the main quest. So that actually was a really great way for me to integrate 
other parts of the main storyline, such as uh, certain stories may only trigger if you are have achieved a certain loyalty level to one king or to another king, or if you have you know become a knight, then only certain story events will trigger under certain conditions. So it actually gave me a lot of tools to play with for the main storyline as well, which is uh, basically a three pronged story story branch where you can take sides with one king versus the other or vice versa, or there's a, a more neutral path with a secretive uh, a secret society of wizards that's trying to correct things in the kingdom. Oh, so you cre- so you created the you created a fantasy version of the Illuminati. Got it. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and the I will ad- I will admit that a philosophy I've had I've had whenever I write um, modules for my own table is to take a setup that I call tiers and tent poles, mm-hmm. which is something I wish I could say I came up with the name, but I. I um ripped I ripped it off from gargoyles because the way the way that they would set up episodes was was here's episodes that you can put in any order because TV networks hate hate um serialization mm-hmm. but the but the but they can only be between these milestone episodes gotcha oh so in that regard there's side quests that can be that can be in any that can be taken in any order but only between certain only between certain major events yeah that's that's a really good analogy for this um each location is basically its own small sandbox Mm -hmm. so there are things exclusive to to each individual location that do not branch out in any way and then there are also things that that lead to other locations um so along the main story quest, uh, you know, the the intended storyline, of course, is uh, probably the more neutral and correct, you know, outcome. But uh, each of these locations will give you hints or or give you story hooks that will lead you to other locations to kind of pull the characters through the kingdom um, in a. Not not in a linear way at all, because they could at any time break off and go somewhere else, and that that is absolutely fine. The dungeon master just flips to the appropriate chapter, and you know, spends some time traveling there and fighting randoms. But uh, mm-hmm. uh, it's de- definitely not a linear path. But there, it does give you meaningful reasons to explore the next location. So the players are never left going, "Okay, what do we do now?" I guess we just pick somewhere and go check it out. You know, um, so. Y- I hope I answered your question. I'm not... Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now, that brings me to one of the other bit, one of the other selling points, and one that I'd be lying if I said this was this was the um, first time that I've that I've had this covered in the temple because, well, I co- well I had the guy in for um, for honor for and for glory and his tur- and his tournament module <laughs> just a, just a few weeks ago, so. Mm-hmm. Great minds think alike. Let's talk about jousting. So, uh, hold on. You just so for honor and glory is another five E adventure with jousting. Um, for honor and for gl- and for glory is its own beast. It's not ne- it's not necessarily tied to five E. Okay, but but they have their own. Th- but they recently put out a, mo- a a Kickstarter for a module called the Grand Tournament. I will definitely check that out as soon as I'm done here. I'm going to make a note of that. Mm-hmm. Alright, so let's talk about jousting. Yeah. So, so how do you how do you have how do you have jousting work? Um so we have a very simple uh rule system for the joust. Uh basically each each one of the mounts in the game uh, has a series of keywords associated with it. So, and each of these keywords will give either a bonus or a penalty to writing this creature in a joust, right? Uh, so, we have five different breeds of giant lizards, five different breeds of 
giant goats and horses, etc. Uh, we also have wild creatures that, such as dire wolves, giant elks, and boars that can be um, either captured or befriended and ridden as mounts in the game as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we devised a series of keywords to uh, grant bonuses and penalties for, for each different mount. For example, the giant lizards all have cold-blooded because they are slow to respond. They don't take commands very well. Um, so it's not just for actual cold-blooded creatures like giant lizards. This is also be for like pack mules and things of that nature that, that maybe just are not so action oriented as, as say a war horse might be. Okay. Um, so a cold blooded creature might give you a minus one penalty uh, in the joust. Right. And this is, this is a kind of a, a cumulative effect and it only affects one dice roll in the joust. So it's, it's very important, but it's also not a game breaker. You know, if you have the best mount versus the worst mount, we, we've done all sorts of play testing, um, and it's it's actually surprisingly super balanced, and we're very happy with the rule set. Mm -hmm. So, cold blooded. Uh, you can also have discipline, which is uh, like a trained mount that's you can either pay for training or spend time role playing that, and you know the dungeon master can reward you with training, um, and that gives you like a plus two bonus. You can have Unbreakable, which is a, a plus one for creatures that are, you know, brave and headstrong and have no fear of, of conflict. Um, obviously, if you have a wild creature or an un, unruly, then those would be uh, negative modifiers. I think wild is negative three, unruly is negative two. Mm -hmm. And you can train those creatures and they become disciplined and lose the unruly or the wild feature. Okay. So you can over time you can improve your mounts by either paying for training at, at specific um, like ranches or or you know lizard farms and such, or you can um, train them yourselves, you know through through role playing and, and interacting with your dungeon master. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, hang on, I just lost my train of thought. Okay, so the other thing is bonding. We created a, this is purely related to how, how you role play with your, with your mount, whether it be in combat or on adventures. Some people, you know, really get into the caring for their mounts and, you know, brushing them down and making sure they have special treats that they buy, etc. Other people may go on, you know, dangerous adventures with their mounts and become bonded, you know, through surviving these terrible things together. Um, so the dungeon master can award you with levels of bonding well, up to three. So plus one, plus two, and plus three. That also adds to this cumulative score. Mm -hmm. So at the end, you take your mount's particular keywords and your bonding level and figure out what your mount's jousting score is. Uh, and it could be negative four all the way to uh, you know plus plus five, six, seven. I, I think probably the best you can do is six. I think if I'm, I don't have all the rules right in front of me, but uh, so then when you start start the joust, both players declare or both participants declare whether they are attempting to strike at the chest and the shield or the head of their opponent. Uh, hitting the head, uh, breaking your lance on their head scores you double points, but obviously it's it's a more difficult task. It raises the armor class of your opponent. Mm -hmm. uh, so once both have declared their intentions. Then they roll an animal handling check, applying the bonus or or the penalty of their mount's particular um, jousting score. And this just reflects how well this mount responds to your orders and how well it understands what its you know what its goals and intentions are, um, and just how well it behaves when you're trying to control it and direct it in the joust. So how well do you control? What's the what's the relationship between you and your mount is the first thing, uh, and we have de developed a table that will grant you either bonuses or penalties based on the result of this animal handling check. Okay, so I think the base the base level is a fifteen. You're trying to you're trying to hit at least a fifteen animal handling check, and then you start getting bonuses to your attack roll, and anything under that you start getting penalties to your attack roll. So then when the jousters meet in the middle, you're both 
rolling an attack against your opponent's armor class and applying that bonus from your animal handling check. Um, and I know I'm saying a lot of words. I hope it is coming across as simple as it actually is when it's played out in front of you. Yeah. But it's basically two checks, animal, animal handling check, and then you make your attack roll and apply appropriate modifiers. Uh, so after the modifiers are applied, uh, anyone who hits their opponent's armor class um, breaks their lance. And if you if you attack their head, then their armor class gets a plus five bonus. If you could still break your lance, then you score two points instead of one. And then you roll damage like normal. And we have uh, you can take either an athletics or an acrobatics check, so strength or dexterity base to remain on your horse. Um, and uh, the difficulty level being 10 plus half the damage that you take. So if you're still on your horse and your opponent's still on their horse, then you do another pass. And whoever scores the most points in three passes wins. Alternatively, of course, if you take enough damage and you fail your check, you are dismounted from your horse or your lizard or your goat or whatever you happen to be riding, mm -hmm. and you automatically lose your eliminated from the joust. Uh, as an optional tournament rule... We also have, if you're dismounted, you also forfeit your mount to your opponent. Now, the honorable thing to do is to give your opponent the opportunity to purchase their mount back for half of the value of the creature. Mm -hmm. But not everyone plays by the rules in Banners of Honor. Yeah. And I'm guessing that I'm guessing that within the book you'll have a bit you'll have a bit of a quick reference for the, for this thing. No. Oh, for sure. And on the inside of the uh, Game Master screen as well. Mm -hmm. And with the... You did, men you did mention... Um, you mentioned the... You mentioned special effects if you're aiming for the head... If you're deliberately trying to aim for the head. But mm -hmm. what sort of... What sort of factors would occur if you aimed elsewhere? Um... As far as uh, we basically, I mean, in a friendly or I mean, let me see how best to word this. Basically, we don't have any other options other than the, the chest and the torso area, which is the shield and chest armor mm -hmm. or the head. Um, so we, we have rules in place to prevent, you know, shenanigans like trying to uh, hold your lance sideways to like clothesline your opponents and stuff like that. Well, I'm pretty sure somebody could do it, but it but but it would probably cause some issues. But yeah, um, what recommendations would you have as far as targeting other areas besides the you know the torso or the head? Um, because we have rules preventing intentionally targeting your opponent's mount, for example. Yeah. I don't want I don't want to I don't want to say too much on that on that yet because um I've I've talked about in the past how one little change to one rule can have massive effects on on other on other rules. Uh -huh. The big example of this kind of thing that I always give is why people have such an issue with um sprint in Halo. I know it might be of a stretch to bring up a shoot to bring up a shooter when we're talking about tabletop, but the pro the problem is with with something like Halo, you have you have a very um a very tight control with the with what's known as the golden triangle. Mm -hmm. And by adding sprint, you're putting in two different movement styles, which means not which mean which affects not only the way ma the way maps are going to feel, but the way weapons are going to feel, and thus the way firefights are going to feel. Gotcha. So it yeah. easy to say, well, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? You're just having people. You're just having people run. The big deal is the is that one is that one thing um, cascades. It breaks the balance. Yeah, that I go I personally. Having it break, um, there's saying a, that it breaks the balance is going a little far, but close enough. Yeah, I understand what you mean. Like it, it's not, it's not unplayable. It's not unenjoyable for sure, but it doesn't have the the same, um, like perfect symmetry that the that the original had. I feel that way about uh, there's a game series Left for Dead, mm -hmm. 
And I think the first one is an absolute masterpiece, one of the best games ever made. And then the second one, they're like, yeah, we'll just take all of that and put more boss enemies and, you know, like more explosions or something. Like, it, it, it didn't feel as nearly as well balanced as the original game. In the, in the original game, every single thing had a purpose and, and served a purpose and made sense. And in the second game, it was like, oh, this is like random. And it, it didn't feel tactical or as enjoyable at all. Um, I lost the image, but I remember somebody um, statting out the survivors in Left 4 Dead using mm-hmm. uh, World of Darkness's rule set. Um, I wish I still had that document because I think it would have been interesting to try and conver- to try and convert that to up to other setups. Um, now, what I find interesting when it comes to when it comes to the importance of mounts is having a ma- having a mount is some is something that some pl- some players will take to and some players won't. And because no mm-hmm. matter how no matter how many ways you try and slice it, um, having a mount, it much like having an animal companion, does mean that you have another um, page to manage. Sure. Oh. Yeah, uh, this is definitely a campaign designed for people who are, you know, embracing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think there's one important thing that I didn't touch on real quick, and then I'll get right back to this. So. A lot of these mounts, you might say, why would you take, you know, a mount that's cold-blooded and stubborn if you can have a warhorse that, you know, has all these bonuses instead? Uh, that's because some of our breeds of giant lizards can breathe fire, for example, or, you know, uh, climb climb walls and vertical surfaces, etc. So they have a lot of combat, like, out-of-jousting skills and abilities that might make them more valuable to the players. And then as you bond with this creature, of course it, it makes sense that you would use it in the joust. You know what I mean? There's, so I just wanted to throw that. I wouldn't be surprised if if full on if full on war horses are a bit more high maintenance as well. Because big oh. guy means big appetite. Oh for sure. Yeah. Uh yeah, that was that was one of the my favorite things so far is uh the food for the giant lizards is you have to keep live rats in a box to feed them (laughs) or, you know, or find them sustenance in some other way. But that's an option that you can, you can buy feed for them in the form of a box of rats. Well, I guess in some cases that's a good, that's a good impetus to, to be out in the wilderness adventuring because whatever you end up, whatever, whatever you end up killing in an encounter, Hey, that's food, on the mount, food. that's free food. That's free food. You don't have to pay for. That's right. Uh, so, but yeah, to get back to your point, um, of course, you know this campaign for for knights and you know jousting, etc. It's going to be for those that lean into having animal companions and having a mount and uh, who want to play that chivalrous knightly creature or character. Excuse me. However, as I mentioned before. There's also a cabal of secretive wizards threaded throughout this kingdom. So there's every opportunity for players who don't want to lean into that to maybe instead take on the role of uh, a spy for this, uh, for this secret society and uh, infiltrate some of, these, some of these kingdoms and courts and to gather information. So they, could, they can serve other purposes. While one character is you know, competing in the lists, uh, another character can be breaking into the Lord's bedchamber and stealing secret documents or something. Mm-hmm. Now that brings me to honor and loyalty. Now, you've just, mm-hmm. now you talked you've talked about the honor mechanic as it was presented in the G, in the GM's guide. Which, as an as an aside, the thing I'll always remember from that guide was the time that the, the time that they claimed that samurai could just be reskinned paladins. <laughs> which was very very dumb. Yeah. But I understand what they're saying I suppose if you're thinking of like samurais having magical attacks with their swords, you know like some video game variants would. Um uh, but yeah, no, it's a little too simplified for sure. Well, that well that in trying trying to put samurai and sha in the same in the same set of paragraphs, that's a way to get people really mad. <laughs> <laughs> But honor and loyalty. Yeah. 
So you've described so you've described honor as as the seventh stat. Yes, is it and you may have noticed. Is it something that you're generating the same way you generate um, care, um, ability scores? Not at all. Um, it is treated just like an ability score throughout the adventure. Uh, you've probably noticed that we spell honor with the uh, the British spelling, British English spelling of the word instead of the uh, American English, you know, H O N O R. That's twofold. First of all, I'm not trying to get a cease and desist letter from wizards because, you know, of their optional rules in the Dungeon Master Guide. Second of all, I want to differentiate our system from, from their uh, suggested optional rule set in the Dungeon Master Guide. Um, so our honor starts at a neutral. Uh, 10 for everyone. Mm -hmm. And then at the end of each adventuring day, so I've incorporated a lot of things in this campaign that I do in my in my own home game, right? So at the end of every adventuring day, when the, when the characters take a rest, we have like a cleanup phase where I'm like, okay, uh, everyone check off a ration or explain to me how you're getting food for the day, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Just to make sure that there are resources being uh, expended throughout throughout the adventure. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the adventuring day, after all of your decisions and actions for the day are done, the dungeon master will reflect on those or whatever notes he's made for your character and decide: Have you behaved honorably on this adventuring day, or you know, cumulatively over the last series of adventuring days, or, or have you been behaving dishonorably? And, and taking dishonorable actions. And of course, we have an entire code of chivalry that gives guidelines, excuse me, guidelines for characters to follow who uh, are wishing to, you know, be virtuous and honorable. Mm -hmm. And the dungeon master can then award you or penalize your um, honor score. So you can say, hey, your honor has increased or your honor has decreased. And uh, we do that at the end of the adventuring day, so there's no takebacks. I don't want someone saying, uh, yeah, we're going to steal the potions from, from the church's lockbox. And they're like, ooh, that's going to be an honor hit for, you know. And they're like, oh, no, 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 I don't do that. No, no, no. Live your, live your best life. Do your thing. And then at the end of the day, we'll, we'll reconcile your actions, you know. Mm -hmm. So to, to avoid any of that, uh, you know, like, I don't know. Like meta gaming, I suppose would be the the best way to describe that. Mm -hmm. um, we we've written the rules so that this is all calculated at the end of the day. Um, so you have to you're forced to kind of live with the choices that your character makes in that sense for your honor. Mm -hmm. um, there is guidelines for the dungeon master as far as what level of actions would would dictate, say, an honor of five, right? Which would be really bad. If your honor was a five, that would be super low. Um, so if you were, say, stealing an apple off of an apple cart, that wouldn't necessarily, you know, justify dropping from a 6 to a 5. But it may justify falling from a 15 to a 14. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So these actions are weighted on on a scale. It's not, it's not just every good action gives you up one and every bad action gives you down one. It's more of like a... Like a, it's a scale with a lot of gray area and a lot of interpretation from the dungeon master. Mm -hmm. um, so your your honor is just how you are perceived by other characters in the setting who follow this honor system. So it's an it's so, a external honor system, not an internal one. Yes. Which so certainly makes sense. I mean, yeah, of course. I, I think I think it's the best way, you know, for interacting with a lot of knights and lords and kings, etc. We needed some sort of scale for for those characters to interact with, you know, some sort of uh, reputation. I guess this could be like a karma system, right? Um, and uh, basically, if other knights, even if they're enemy knights, if you have a high honor skill or a high honor stat, they would respect you. As a knight, they may still challenge you to singles combat, right? They may still demand things of you, you know, in accordance to the laws of the land or whatever. But you will be treated better by those who follow the the codes of chivalry in the land. Mm 
Um, and as for the loyalty program, the program, the loyalty <laughs> system, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, you buy 10 of our books, you get one free. No. Um, the loyalty system is uh, just a way for us to track the, the characters' interactions with the factions of the game. Mm-hmm. So we're actually, we're only tracking, we're not tracking the wizards because they, they, you can rebuff the wizards and, and treat them badly and not be a part of what they're doing. They're still desperate, and if you decide to change your mind later, they would be willing to accept your help. Mm-hmm. The Two Kings, on the other hand, is very much a, a push and pull. So you you may not want to make enemies with one of them, but as you do more actions to please the, the lords and supporters and kings on one side, um, you're hurting your loyalty score with the other side. For example, uh, once you complete some side quests in service to one of the lords of Kirill, you may be asked uh, to become a, a citizen of that of that region, right? So if you are a, a visitor in the swamp of Griston and you perform tasks uh, on behalf of the lord of Griston, he may say, hey, how would you like to be, you know, one of my loyal retainers and, and become a citizen of Griston? And as your loyalty increases even further, he may summon you to his court and perform a knighting ceremony. And then you become a knight of Griston, which is one of, let me think, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, like one of like 10 different lords that you can choose to serve mm-hmm. in the game. So if you become a knight of Griston, then he's your guy. He's loyal to, you know, uh, he's loyal to one king and the, the lords across the river are loyal to a different king. So then he starts pushing his his lord's agenda on you, right? You're his loyal servant. So then you start doing other tasks and it creates more and more loyalty towards this king until you eventually could be summoned before the king and granted a lordship of your own and a broken down castle, which requires some, some refurbishing and uh, some complications of its own. Mm-hmm. But you can become from... Uh, just a lowly adventurer who's washed upon the shores of Kirill to a well-respected nobleman and then a knight and then a lord with your own castle. And if you're ambitious and merciless enough, you can even become king of the entire land. Mm-hmm. And- uh, but these... I'm sorry. I don't feel like I explained very well. So the loyalty, <laughs> the loyalty score uh, tracks when certain events would happen. So when you achieve loyalty... Uh, 10, for example, that would trigger whichever lord your characters are closest to to summoning you for for a a knighting, right? And you can, of course, reject the knighting, which costs you some loyalty, right? So if you you reject uh, one of these lords attempting to knight you into service and say, no, 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 I I don't do that, uh, then you will take a hit with your loyalty and your loyalty score will drop. Uh, and if your loyalty score raises high enough, that would trigger you being summoned to the king and, and becoming a lord as well. Mm-hmm. And if your loyalty score were to drop low enough, for example, if you're seen wearing the colors and carrying the banner of a rival lord across the river, um, then you'll take a penalty to that score, which can trigger other events such as you being declared outlaws and being hunted. Anytime you're anytime you're on this side of the river, you could be hunted you know, to the ends of the earth by the other knights. Or or potentially somebody put somebody um putting out like a out. bounty. Yeah, because while while the while the while it might not while it might not be as big of a deal for the for the for people in the army to try and to try and take you out. There's always some there's always somebody who's willing to pay out. That's right. That's right. So um yeah we just tried to all of the systems that we've created have this sort of number scale that triggers certain events. And and we have uh, nice tables and, and descriptions of all of the events, guidelines for Dungeon Masters, and at the end of each chapter. So a normal cha- uh, Have you downloaded the free sample chapter for Danbridge? Yes. Okay. So you can see we have descriptions for important locations, right? We have several shops. We have uh, some inns and the... Um, governor's mansion, etc. And then there are small interactions that can be had at each one of these locations, basically regardless of what's going on 
in the in the wider world. And then at the bottom of the chapter, or at the end of the chapter, uh, I say the bottom because I'm looking at it on a computer screen most of the time. Uh, at the end of the chapter, there was a series of optional story events. And some of those trigger depending on, you know, if you take sides in a certain conflict in the town, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically the way each one of these locations is broken down. There's a series of locations. We try to make them as varied and interesting as possible with uh, some really cool special mechanics that, um, I say mechanics, but like just game rules that are not, you know, flagship, not just something that we're trying out, right? For example, one of our shops, instead of selling spell scrolls, which you could maybe find in any adventure setting, it's a candle shop that sells spell wicks. And these are basically candles with spells trapped inside of them. Um, they go off one use only, like like a spell scroll, but they have other, other um, behaviors as well. And then in the end, you're left with a, a beautiful smelling candle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, the way th the way that the um, the setting was was put up, especially with this faction system, um, mm -hmm. in a roundabout way, I'm kind of reminded of the state of the Inner Sphere in BattleTech just before the Succession Wars really kicked off. Well, the first succession war because they had because they kept having them for about two hundred years <laughs> until until everybody fi until everybody figured out yeah nobody's nobody's going to be first lord because we're just going to keep killing each other. Um, well, I don't know anything about BattleTech. I don't want to go in the Book of Grudges just like that, but I don't know what you're talking about. Um. <laughs> I will. There's a lot. There, there's a lot of ground to cover with bat, with BattleTech, as you'd expect with a setting that's been around for decades. Sure. And one, and one that does, and one that doesn't have a hate boner for its own audience. Uh, but it in the early days of in the early days of the of the thirty of in the late in the um twenty eighth century. There was. The strongest unifying power within within the uh, within the air within the territory of humanity, known as the Inner Sphere, was Star League. There was a, a the Amera Civil War happened. The 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 line that had been, that had been the de facto head of Star League was pretty was pretty much killed was pretty much killed off, and with. And with the usurper taking taking hold, even though he was killed, you, you had the problem of there was no line of succession for who's going to be the next first lord. Gotcha. Um. But the the point is is that the point is is that there was a power vacuum and everybody wanted to everybody wanted to fill it because everybody felt that they had they they had some claim to it. And then you just have to figure out who has the strongest claim or the strongest arms, right? Yeah, and like I said, like, kinda... like I said, it took it it took it took it took about two, it took over two hundred years for the, for them to figure out. Yeah, nobody's take nobody's taking it. Um, and the reason I bring that up is because from what I from what I understand, Lady Kiss Lady Cassandar. Mm -hmm. Had was was basically that was basically the de facto ruler of Kiral, and and ruled over all ruled all, ruled over all of the factions. But when she decided to leave, you have a massive power vacuum, and and um a bu and several people vying for power within it. Okay, so. Uh... This kingdom started as a series of warring tribes, right? They're just, uh, you know, warriors who, for one reason or another, can't stop going to battle with one another and, and fighting over territory and land, just like, you know, all of human history. Mm -hmm. And Lady Cassandar is an ancient bronze dragon. So in the Kickstarter video, you might have noticed there's a little hint when the when the torches light up around her, her shadow is not that of uh, her human form. 
um, which was a, a beautiful piece of art created by my good friend Ajay. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so, as an ancient bronze dragon, she just is saddened by you know um, unnecessary death and and violence. So instead of trying to rule these people, she decided to teach them to be better and to become better. It was Lady Cassandar that handed down the uh, chivalric code of Kirill to each of the lords of Kirill, who were the heads of these tribes. She chose the most virtuous and honorable from each tribe and knighted them as a lord of Kirill. They become the first knights of Kirill, and there were uh, eight original, I'm sorry, nine original lords of Kirill. Mm-hmm. Um, and from after years of working with them and teaching them, you know, to be honorable and chivalrous and, and to carry themselves uh, as good honorable knights she brought them together in the first uh, council of the lords and chose the most virtuous and honorable from among them to rule as king of all of Kirill. so she is our lady of the lake figure she's our kingmaker Mm -hmm. right and uh the sword that she uses to knight this this chosen king and and the king becomes the carrier of this special blade called the king seeker Um, this sort of allows you to see into the hearts of men, right? Or women, for that matter. Mm -hmm. So she will always, whenever the king dies, they will reconvene a council. Lady Cassandar will come and use them the sword, determine who among the lords of Kirill is the most honorable and virtuous to become the true king of Kirill, the true ruler. Maybe it's a queen. That part's not so important. What's important is each one of these lords is solely responsible for his tribe, for his region. You can pass down your title, your lordship, in any way that you see fit. You can do it um, tr- in the traditional way, from from father to son to son, or to you know oldest child. Or you can have, uh, say, a test of arms to determine who's going to be the new lord. You know, after after your time has passed, or you or when the Lord dies, whatever the system in each region, each region determines their Lord in any way they wish, right? They're given that freedom. Mm -hmm. However, they are incentivized to develop a system that always brings the, the most honorable and virtuous to the forefront because only that person can be the King of the entire kingdom. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, So one of these Lords was unexpectedly surpassed for this title of king. And in his place, his brother was chosen, who by the rules of the land should not have even been present at the council, but mitigating circumstances, they're all explained Mm -hmm. in great detail in the book. Um, So both of these brothers are present at the council, and it's the younger brother that's chosen to be the king. Out of all the lords present, the wrong brother was chosen, which leads to a uh for is it fratricide when you kill your brother i don't know my big words right now. yes okay uh which leads to uh fratricide that is disguised as you know death in honorable combat when it was just the two brothers present but of course using the king seeker lady cassandra is able to see the truth and know this man's heart and how dark it really is so becoming enraged heartbroken angered at the the betrayal as it's known um she breaks the king seeker the blade that that determines who's the one true king of kirill and from its pieces from its remains she crafts a crown and places it on the betrayer's head and he becomes the betrayer king mm-hmm. uh, who is a cursed individual in life all of the other lords of kirill banded they rose up against him and realized you know, how terrible it was that they lost the love and affection of their Lady Cassandra. Uh, and he was basically relegated to his region of Elderth uh, in one corner of our map here. I don't know if you have access to the map on the Kickstarter page, maybe. But, uh... I do. The curse... It's a low... It's... A low re- it's... Oh, okay, okay. So, uh, bottom right corner with the purple icon there. So he's relegated to this region um, for the rest of his life. 
And when he dies, he finds no rest, no, no afterlife awaiting him. Um, he just continues to suffer, as do all of those who followed him and treated him as king in life. So all of his subjects also serve in undeath and must uh, follow the orders or, or at least continue living their life in the region. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is very much inspired by like the pirate's curse from, from Pirates of the Caribbean, where, where they can't, can't die but can't take any enjoyment from life. They can't, you know, they're bound in a certain way to their, to their ship or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's the same way, except this, the entire kingdom is trapped in this, this cursed undeath. So, if the characters at some point wish to retrieve all of the pieces of this sword and reforge it and find the one true king of Kiro, they're going to have to get in there and retrieve it. And uh, that's a pretty daunting task. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously we can't go into, ev- into every lo- every lord in, Ki- in Kiro. There's too many, but... There are. What would... But what would given the fa- given the um, way that the cover is set up, would it be fair of me to assume that there are two dominant factions within Kirill? There are. Uh, so the lords of Kirill have broken right down the middle at this point, which is why they can't agree on who should be the next king. Mm-hmm. Without the guidance of Lady Cassandra, they've they've uh, resulted in just doing like a democratic vote among the lords where every lord must vote for another lord who's not themselves and that served them pretty well for most of most of the remaining history but as of now there's a new rising power uh the church of otaus which is gaining popularity in the east and their champion of otaus is uh being held up as uh a hero and a and a chosen one who maybe should be the king, and a lot of these lords have converted to this religion and are standing behind this man and his um, miracles, right? Mm-hmm. And then on the other half of the the other half of the kingdom is afraid of the influence that this church has been quickly gaining and how it might affect you know their business opportunities or trade or or their own power, right? How is this church gaining so much power so quickly? Uh, so you have the um, the believers on one side all banding together to loft up their champion as the chosen king with roughly half of the lords of Kirill all making a vote for him. Mm-hmm. And on the other side, you have the last king's son uh, being held up as the potential king by the by the remaining lords he's the one person they could all agree on you know he was a a very noble young man always served the kingdom well and you know uh so while the lords couldn't agree who amongst them should be the king they all agreed that he would be he would be good enough to to keep the church at bay Mm -hmm. right so now we have two factions of equal force um who both have selected their king, and now it's just a matter of trying to convert one of the lords from the other side onto your faction uh, to, to tip the scale in your balance. So at least you have a, a justifiable claim to the throne. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's there's a lot of political stuff going on there that I don't want to dive into too deeply because I don't have my notes in front of me, and, and quite frankly, I would just ramble. Um but yeah, there's uh, political prisoners, and there's uh, you know sieges to be waged, and and spies, and jousting tournaments, um, parades, and ambushes, and assassination attempts. Yeah, lots and lots of cool stuff. Since you mentioned pitched battles earlier on, is that something that you've cons- that you've considered as a possibility in the cam- in the module? It is. Uh, as you can imagine, that would be a huge undertaking. We have not, we have not decided definitively to include a massive pitched battle. But I can tell you right now, if I do, it'll be climactic. It'll absolutely be like an end-all, you know, situation for the for the campaign. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think I would have to devise 
a system of like actions that lead to different results, right? Like the characters would be trying to accomplish a certain set number of goals. And depending on how many they accomplish, you know, the tides of battle would ebb and flow. I, that's going to be something to really think about Mm -hmm. because obviously we don't want to get it wrong. We don't want it to be messy or difficult to run. Um, which, uh, pretty much describes pitched battles, right? Yeah. So, yes, in my heart of hearts, do I want a pitched battle? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I'm just trying to find a way to not write 100 pages of rules for it and make it uh, fit in seamlessly. Um, I'm confident that we will. Yeah. I just haven't done it yet, and I don't want to make promises, you know what I mean, based on the work that we've done so far. Mm-hmm. Now, given... This is a question that I end up asking a lot when it comes to campaign settings, but how high of fantasy is is Banners of Honor? Is it a, is it a case where ma- where magic is is fa- is fairly regular or are there going to be some questions being asked if if an outright mage is within the party? Um ultimately that's going to be up to each table to decide for themselves. The setting itself tends to be a more low fantasy setting. There are, of course, wizards and mages throughout. You know, each location will have some some examples of of magic and magic users, etc. They tend to be um, like nobles or or court court wizards. You know, the type that uh, would be advising the lords or kings, etc. So they they are present. People are aware of them. They are kind of special figures in the setting. Um, But yeah, if if there are other mages out there in the wilderness, it wouldn't be totally shocking, I don't think. But you could definitely lean into that if if you're a dungeon master. We also have uh, on on the oligarchy side of the map... um, Oh, wait, no. I'm sorry. What's... Oh, man. Big words. On on. The the church side. What's that called? Church ruled state. Um, theoc- theocracy or theocratic. Theo- theo- yes. Oh yeah. On the theocratic. Thank you. Thank you, man. It's been a long day. I'm so sorry. <laughs> theocratic side of the map. Um, there there is a one city in particular where non divine magic has been outlawed, mm-hmm. uh, and this is just to help the the church gain control over the the wizards and the the citizens of that region so the the wizards at one time had a great amount of influence in this city and through politics and uh you know religious fervor they're able to manipulate the laws of the land in such a way that eventually oh what do you know we have problems with the wizards being a wizard's illegal now right so instead of just taking that lying down the wizards just take their castle and fly away uh, so that's how we end up with a, a secret cabal of, of wizards and a flying ca- castle trying to uh, set things right. Mm-hmm. Now, what are you shooting for as far as a page count for the for uh, banners? We're trying for 350 pages. Which that's, de- that's definitely a beefy boy. Um, it I sure is, pe- but it we calculated it out. Yeah, yeah, we just looked at, you know, the Danbridge and other chapters that we have completed and then calculated it out for the chapters that we don't have completed and we're like, yep, that's a lot of pages. But, uh, yeah, I'm excited. Mm-hmm. And I do want to congratulate you on on managing to, managing to get well over your initial goal since at the time of this recording you're at 24.7 thousand. And you're only oh, yeah. for 15,000. Yeah, I really hope to make that next stretch goal in the night mm-hmm. because I'm very excited for... Um, so every time we break a stretch goal, we get onto the next one and I also reveal one more stretch goal. And the next stretch goal that we're going to reveal, uh, I'll go ahead and tell you because hopefully by the time this goes live, we'll already be there, is poster-sized maps of Kirill inside every book for every every backer of the physical book. 
and I I can I can certainly appreciate that. I can certainly appreciate that. Oh. Hey, uh, um, could we possibly pause for one second? I don't know how this normally. Sorry about that, folks. Ha um, outside things happen. But what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the PDF version? Uh, so the PDF will be released as soon as we get everything uh, written and laid out and ready to go to print. So about the time we're sending it to the printers, we will be releasing a PDF for everyone. Our goal for that, um, oh man, I would say June of 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, this, I know a lot of a lot of other companies when they go to Kickstarter, they're like, "Our book is done and everything's ready," and you know all the layout and the artwork and everything. We we are using Kickstarter in the tr traditional sense of that this is our first project. We're a startup company, and we literally need this Kickstarter to get our business off the ground. Um, so we do have a lot of work to do. We anyone who has ever hired me for commissions or you know worked with me in any capacity knows that communication is one of my special skills. So I guarantee you that no one will be left in the dark as to what's going on. Where's my book? You may not. You may not uh, get your book as quickly as as some of these more experienced and well developed companies can deliver a Kickstarter book, uh, but you will know exactly where we're at and what's going on every single step of the way. Mm -hmm. And really, that's the that communication is the important part. I've always thought, like even an update, you know, I've seen companies. I'm sure you have too, that just go months and months and months without saying anything. And it's never because things are going so awesome that they have so much they can't wait to tell you, right? Hmm. Um, I've always just thought open and honest communication would serve them way better than, than stonewalling their audience. I give some people a pass when this when this kind of thing happens because they're, because they're a one-man operation. But sure. That's it, but that is a special circumstance. And the sole reason I give them a pass is, be is because, well, I'm a one-man operation. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I mean, I have uh, my partner, Sammy, but uh, I, th I think he would even tell you it's it's like an 80-20 um, separation of responsibilities. You know, he I couldn't I could absolutely couldn't have created this project without him. But uh, uh, uh yeah, I mean, he even told me personally the other day that, like, this is my baby. It's my creation. He's just here to help me along with anything that I need, you know, as far as uh, he creates a lot of the stat blocks and uh, he creates a lot of the, the mini boss, you know, characters and, and fights. And then we play test them and make sure that all of the mechanics and rules that he's created for these bosses are fun and uh, challenging. But uh, yeah, for the most part, I'm um, project managing, art directing writing a vast majority of the project, doing the social media, doing um, a lot. I have many, many hats for this project. Mm -hmm. But with all that said, I'll, I'll be looking forward to seeing how it turns out. And I, I want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness at play here. No problem at all. Like I really appreciate you giving me an opportunity to talk about the project. We're live right now. Uh, we've already more than 150% funded. We are, oh, let me think here, about five or six backers away from our next stretch goal. Mm -hmm. um, so hopefully by the time I wake up in the morning, we'll have already knocked that out, and I'll have to scurry in here and do some graphic design updates. Um, but... Yeah, I, I just, uh, anything I can do to get the word out, get some eyeballs on the project, you know, talk about it, share my excitement, um, and just, uh, I need to, you know, grow my community. Mm -hmm. The biggest, the biggest challenge by far, the biggest challenge is I've been a miniature painter for, or professionally for, um, about seven years. I have an audience of a couple thousand, three thousand people or so which is very small compared to the 30,000 emails that Nord has collected right we just I, I've never had a reason to collect 
emails from people before as a painter, mm -hmm. right? So um, I just started an emailing list for this project. We've collected, I don't know, 350 emails or something like that, right? So I can send out my newsletter and tell everyone about Banners of Honor. It is a small drop in a bucket compared to Nord Games sending out an email letting everyone know about Banners of Honor to 30,000 people. I couldn't believe the power of their emailing list and just how small and, and you know, in comparison, ineffective my, my own efforts have been, right, compared to these larger companies. Mm -hmm. uh, so marketing is absolutely... Absolutely challenge number one, just eyeballs on the project, anything and everything I can do to spread the word, you know, share the link, get a, get a retweet, get, get, you know, get anyone to talk about it on their, on their Twitch streams or anything I can do. I appreciate every one of you who has contributed to the support of this project. Um, but yeah, it's marketing is a nightmare. That's, that's uh, one of the biggest lessons I'm taking away from this. <laughs> Oh, you're not far off. But anytime you see fit to return, whether it's to further discuss Banners of Honor, um, to delve further into miniature painting, or just to um, just to laugh at the ranger being useless again, the oh door is always open. As I often say around Thank you very here, much. drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I know some people might get <laughs> mad at me saying that rangers are useless, but... If it was if it was use if it was useful, it wouldn't have been retooled three times in five years. Right. It doesn't mean it's not fun. It's just you know, it's not super effective. Yeah, and to be fair, and this is not a new problem. This has been a this has been a problem since AD and D. <laughs> um. Yeah. But, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>